Thank you very much, Professor Grauberg. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's uh, been involved at the University of Tallinn in making our, uh, this visit so, so much fun, as well as such a learning experience for me. And I want to congratulate Professor Alexi on the um, outstanding honor that the university has, has paid him. When Professor Alexi responds to some of the other speakers, he's going to have to defend his theory. When, when he responds, if he uh, has anything to say in response to what, my remarks, um, it will be to answer some questions, and I have two questions in particular that I want to ask Professor Alexi. I'm interested in interpretation and whether there are any principles, whether it can be a principled activity. I'm not sure I use the word principle in the same sense that Professor Alexi uses it in his, in his theory of principles. Perhaps I'm talking about what the Germans call Grundsatz rather than Princip. But I talked to Professor Poscher and he says these are synonyms. I am talking about basic starting points that you or I or whoever is engaged in legal interpretation ought to adopt for our own conduct as interpreters. And so one, and, and perhaps at various points without me saying it, you'll notice ways in which I've been influenced in this work on interpretation by Professor Alexi's work. And, and one of them is that I think it's very important to pay attention both to the external observer's perspective on legal interpretation, which is my topic, and also on the internal perspective of the, of the person doing the interpreting. I want, to, um, I want to argue that interpretation is a nexus. It's not the only nexus, but it, it is a very important nexus between the two aspects of law. Um, which Professor Alexi calls dual because it's not just that there are happen to be two different aspects of law, but but they're dual because they of the interaction between them. And legal interpretation is one of the most important ways in which the fact, the facts of legal practice and the legal history and the legal and the, and the present um, practice of law relate to the ideal. To, to the question of what is to be done um, from the internal point of view. I want to give you an example of interpretation. I've got a sort of collection of these, and please, anyone who has a really good example, please send it, and I will, I will put it in my zoo. My, in my zoo, I've got examples of things that courts do that they describe as interpretation, which obviously are not interpretation. Obviously, and then um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that expert, senior, well-educated judges working in a professional context and a, and a, and a culture that from, in which they are expected to act responsibly and they expect themselves to act responsibly can describe things as interpretation um, when, it, when you might say that it's anything but interpretation. The European Union legislature passed a regulation providing compensation for, for, for you if your flight is cancelled. And if your flight is delayed, no compensation. If your flight is delayed, you get, uh, you get meals while you're waiting for your flight or, and, and a hotel room if you need to be put up overnight. Um, some people whose flight has been delayed went to the Court of Justice of the European Union, a, an institution charged with giving effect to the law of the European Union. And they said, if your flight's delayed long enough, it's just the same as if it was cancelled. Imagine you're going on a three-day holiday and your flight is delayed for three days. You're in the same position as if it had been cancelled. Now, the Advocate General, amazing part of the European judicial institution that they have an independent advocate to give her opinion before the judges make their decision. She said, there's something to it because if your flight delay is bad enough, it's just the same just the same as if it had been cancelled. But there's a problem. You need to decide how long the delay is, has to be before the, the obligation to compensate arises. That the legislature can do that, and you can't. You judges, your job is to interpret the regulation and this problem. We're not treating the person with an outrageous flight delay the same as the person whose flight is cancelled. This problem cannot be solved by the court. 
You're going to have to tell the legislature to fix it. The judges, with all their background and having heard the arguments of, of counsel, they, they said, well, the principle of equality, that's a, that's a principle. Um, so the regulation must be interpreted as meaning that passengers who, whose flights are delayed can uh, get compensation just as if it had been canceled if they've been delayed for three hours. And they just said that, and that's the law of the European Union today as a result of this judicial decision. Presented as an opinion, I'm ten, I tend to agree with the, um, with the Advocate General that the court couldn't solve this by interpretation. But I think it's very important that they, I, I don't think they were fibbing. I don't think they were telling a lie. I don't think they were pretending. I think they persuaded themselves that it was their role as interpreters to interpret the regulation as meaning that passengers whose flights are delayed can be treated as if it had been cancelled. Now, I'm going to, as, as I promised, tell you some principles, some starting propositions for how to, how to, um, how to interpret. And I, and I want to say that they were, I think, that they were all violated. When we get to my list of principles, they were all violated by this um, interpretation, or you might say so-called interpretation. I'm not really too worried about whether we call it an interpretation or not. Um, to set the scene for my account of some principles of interpretation, I'm, I'm, I want to look at what it is that's being interpreted. But, but before that, while I remember, can I just um, ask Professor Alexi? He doesn't have to answer it now, but I want to ask him the first of my questions. Suppose they were right, as the, as the Advocate General insisted, and as the judges held, that there is, as a matter of European Union law, a principle of equal treatment, a principle of equal treatment. And it is at odds with what the legislature laid down as a rule in the regulation. Remember, the legislature made a rule providing compensation if your flight is cancelled, and providing no compensation if your flight is not cancelled. Well, my question for Professor Alexi is, what is a judge to do if a rule is a peremptory norm to be given effect according to its terms on the one hand, and a principle is to be balanced against other considerations on the other hand? Um, so that's, that's the first of my questions, and I have another one that will come up later. Now, here's how I want to set the scene. I want to ask what they were interpreting, and here, I think the account of what they were doing um, is, is sound and, and, if we understand it the right way, is the right way of understanding the object of interpretation. By the object of interpretation, I mean what it is that they were interpreting. And they said they were interpreting the regulation. I think that's true. Of course, the regulation, it, a, there's a slight ambiguity to it, you might say, the, between um, the fact that the legislature, the commission proposes it and the parliament and the council approve it. The fact that that measure got approval by the legislative agencies. Or does it, the regulation, does that mean the norm or the complex norm or the set of norms established by the regulation? I think, I, I, let me set, set this out very clearly because I think it's foundational for the principles of interpretation. I think the primary understanding of what it is that they ought to have been interpreting, and you can understand what they said this way, is that they ought to have been interpreting the fact of the adoption of this regulation by the legislative institution as a regulation of the European Union. That is the act, the action of the legislature. The job of the interpreter characteristically in the interpretation of statutes and regulations of the European Union is to ascribe a meaning to the action of communicating in the way that they did, that it is to be the law, that. And then you could quote the regulation to finish that statement. So it is a fact, and that's why this, is, this involves the dual aspect of the law. The object, the primary object of interpretation is the fact of action by the legislature. Um, I want to, I'm going to run you through 800 years of history of thinking about interpretation, not for historical purposes, for purposes that I'm, I'm going to explain in a minute, not for historical purposes, 
But in order to put in front of your in the front of your minds a way of thinking about how people ought to interpret, um, and and I just want to point out what all of these clever people, thoughtful people, had to say about the object of interpretation. And I find it just kind of interesting, and maybe you will too, that um, it's a bit floaty. It's a bit uncertain what it is that's being interpreted. Um, even in the work of people with a gift for analytical rigor, like Thomas Aquinas, what is it that the interpreter, the court in this case, the Court of Justice of the European Union, should be interpreting? Well, they interpret the laws. That's compatible with what the Court of Justice said it was doing. But then he says they, they have no right to interpret the intention. Interpret the intention, I sort of start to lose track of what in, interpretation is. Um, and you can't have just, a, just anyone, says Aquinas, interpreting what is useful. And, and, and I, I start to lose track of what interpretation is. Bracton, um, a great, great, English legal scholar, you don't need to read his work, um, it's out of date, but a very good legal textbook of the 1200s. He said, private persons cannot question the acts of kings, the justices cannot discuss the meaning of royal charters. I think that's the, the primary idea. The acts of kings, legislation, the king was a legislator in 1235. Hobbes, Hobbes, it is not the letter but the intendment or meaning, that is to say, the authentic interpretation of the law, which is the sense of the legislator, and therefore the interpretation of all laws. Now, he's got two things going on here. One is interpretation of the law, and the other is interpretation of laws. And I'm not quite sure whether by the law he means the abstract normative content, well, not abstract, abstract and concrete normative content of the whole system, or what, when he says interpretation of all laws, then I think he has the primary idea in mind, ascribing meaning to the fact of legislation, the act of legislation. Bentham, if judges interpret the laws, it's, everything is arbitrary. I'm going to come back to, uh, to that idea. So he's, I, depending on how you understand it, perhaps he also has the primary idea interpreting the law in the sense of the the particular act of legislation. Um, Kelson, uh, interpreting statutes, that, I, that makes sense as part of the primary meaning of, of the primary idea of the object of interpretation. There's also interpretation of individual norms. I've lost, I've lost it. I don't know what he's talking about. Not a sloppy thinker, whatever you say about Hans Kelson. Not a sloppy thinker, but what on earth are we doing? Interpreting norms. Maybe he means identifying the norm that is the result of the statute, but I've lost track. Interpretive, ter interpretation of all norms. I, um, the, the idea of interpretation is too flexible for us, even for rigorous thinkers. Now, Dworkin, this is different. Interpretation of social practices and structures. He's actually denying, rejecting, what I have said is the primary, the primary appropriate object of interpretation for a court. And, and I won't go into his theory. I just want to point out to you that what I've suggested as primary is controversial. Um, here's Frederick Schauer responding to Professor Alexi's work, interpretations of the canonical textual language. Uh, the language. It, um, reaching conclusions because of the meaning of the words. You know what I think? I think this is a secondary understanding of the object of Interpretation, the primary object is the fact that the council and the parliament approved the, the text. And so he's talking rather metaphorically, Schauer, when he talks about interpretations of the canonical textual language. It's not the language that is the object of interpretation. It's the fact that the legislator used that language to make law, in, in my opinion. And, but then you can say this is sort of metaphorical or figurative. And when you say, and when Kelson talks about interpreting norms, you can say that's a metaphorical or figurative way of talking about it. Now, I just want to point out a couple of really interesting things that caught my eye in reading Professor Lexi's work on interpretation. Interpreting constitutional rights. There, uh, you might say, is a way of talking about interpretation that is at odds with what I've been suggesting. But I'm not sure that it is. I'm not sure that it is. Because perhaps, again, 
as in Kelsen or as in Schauer, we can understand this as a figurative way, a secondary way of referring to what I call the primary job. In other words, perhaps we can understand this account of constitutional interpretation as referring to the court's task of ascribing to the meaning the fact that the constitution makers enshrined the constitutional rights that they did. I'm, I'm not certain about this. Now, and here I find this really provocative legal argumentation and what is the same interpretation. And then I think perhaps we disagree because uh, you might say that's a Dworkinian approach to understand the task of interpretation by the judge, not as understanding the meaning of the lawmaker, but as constructing, ar ar arguing in general as to what is to be done. Now, the reason I propose that the ascribing a meaning to the act of legislation is primary is that I think it's a really important aspect of legal systems that they allocate power to make law, power to make law to legislators, but also to contracting parties in a contract. And I think that it is very often the job of the judge to understand what those lawmakers have done. And, and a crucial fact of legal practice that they never should forget, that the law must... Here's, here's a bit of Kelsen that I think we should all agree with. I hope you disagree with almost everything else in Kelsen. But the law must regulate its own creation. Its own creation in the sense of the making of a constitution, which may seem impossible, <laughs> must regulate legislation and must regulate interpretation because it must regulate the ascription of meaning to its own lawmaking acts. Now, here's what I want to point out to you and the reason I've put these great historical figures in front of you, from Aquinas to Bracton to Hobbes to Bentham, they all had an answer to my question of the principles of interpretation. The basic principle is that the authority that made the law should do it. And, and there's a long tradition of calling this authentic interpretation. And there's an inter uh, uh, the tradition of calling it that arises from the, the judgment that that's genuine. That's the real thing. The only one who can interpret the laws is he who can, who can make the laws. The lawgiver has to interpret. No one else can interpret. Um, Aquinas may sound at this point rather authoritarian. In fact, he's surprisingly pragmatic, as we're, we're going to see before the end. Bracton. Bracton thought that judges cannot interpret statutes. They can interpret contracts, because if you and I are in court over our contract, we're the lawmakers, so we ought to interpret it, but we're disagreeing, so as a matter of juridical necessity, the court's going to have to interpret the contract. But statutes, no. With statutes, go ask the king, because the king makes statutes. Hobbes, authentic, there's the phrase authentic. Authentic interpretation is the legislator's, the legislator's prerogative. It kind of fits in with his notion of sovereignty. Um, Bentham, goodness, Be Jeremy Bentham and Thomas Aquinas, if you don't know those two people, these are strange bedfellows. And the reason they're in the same bed is not that Bentham was just a sort of conservative thinker, but he had a very angry, vehement reason for saying that judges should not interpret statutes. He thought that the legislature will form judgments in a way that is alive to and promotes the general happiness, whereas the judge is going to promote the judge's happiness. So he felt very strongly that the job of interpreting ought to be with the legislature. And he had a Interesting scheme, if we had only we had more time, um, for references on the interpretation of statutes to the legislature. Now, and, and it wasn't just Bentham, a friend in Oxford told me that the Prussian Allgemeine Landsrecht does, has a, such a provision for authentic uh, interpretation. And also the Austrian Civil Code, the Austrians here will be able to tell us about that. Now, what I want to propose with great respect to the lawmakers of Prussia and of Austria, and, and great respect for Justinian, the emperor who claimed the power to interpret and banned the writing of commentaries on the meaning of the digest. With great respect to these lawmakers who insisted on authentic interpretation, interpretation by the lawmaker, I don't think it's necessarily the right thing. 
I think that Bentham was on to something, that it's dangerous to the rule of law if a court can decide that legislation means what it likes. And you might say he would think that decision of the Court of Justice, where the legislature obviously decided not to give compensation for a delay, that's just caprice, arbitrariness. We've lost the rule of law. But in fact, I think there's some structural reasons for favoring interpretation by an independent court. It's a kind of separation of powers. You know what? With contracts, I think authentic interpretation would be I ideal. And there's no reason for you and me not to say, well, after we've negotiated and argued about it, okay, we'll act on this interpretation. No reason not to. But the practical problem is a problem for the rule of law when we don't interpret. And having an independent court that will interpret puts us, when we're forming the contract, into a very useful predicament in which we know that we have to be clear in order to establish the agreement insofar as we're able to get it from each other, uh, that the court will interpret the way we want it. And there's something about legislation that's the same. There's actual value in an independent interpreter giving interpretations of the legislation. Imagine the alternative. First of all, references would be impossible because the job of interpretation fits so neatly, so effectively, so usefully into the job of dispute resolution. There's a huge waste if we don't do the interpreting at the point of dispute resolution and send, the, send a reference. Secondly, if we could do it, and if the legislators even cared and were willing to d dedicate the time to it, it would be a window for new kinds of arbitrariness as the legislature today resolves disputes about interpretation by its pursuit of today's political agenda. We couldn't trust a legislature to give effect to the meaning that it had in mind when it made the legislation. So I think there are actually steps forward for the rule of law, even though I'd agree with Bentham that it's dangerous. Here are the principles that I want to put before you. The principles of legal interpretation. Remember, these are from the first person point of view. I, I imagine, you, you do this too. Let's imagine we're judges of the Court of Justice of the European Union. We have to decide what meaning to give to the regulation. That's what they claim to be doing in that case. Well, the first principle, the first principle is that, and well, you know what, there's princ principle zero. Principle zero that you and I ought to adopt is a commitment to legality. Let's start with that. And, and I hope we share it. And you know what, I bet those judges of the Court of Justice, I bet they had that commitment to act according to law. So let's start with that. And then principle number one becomes a forceful principle. The principle that the law confers on the legislature of the European Union, the power to make regulations. And we, you and I had better not forget that. Secondly, remember, I, I, I think I'm right, I, I'd, I'd defend it at greater length if we had more time, to say that it's not irrational and it's not the total abandonment of the rule of law that Bentham thought it was, for the law to give interpretive power to us as judges. Remember what we're imagining. Um, and the law has done so. And, and there, there's value in that. And so we ought to be prepared to ascribe a meaning to the act of the legislature, even though we know that by doing that, the law has conferred a very significant power on us. Look how nobody knows what interpretation is. Nobody even, they, nobody even really agrees on what the object is, and the law has given this power to us. So we ought to be aware of the remarkable power that the law has given us. And, and it may, you know, it, unlike the Prussian code or the Austrian code, the, the lawmaker may never have said anything. They may simply have given that power to us by giving us a jurisdiction to apply the law. And it's a discretion, a power that results from that um, from that jurisdiction. And, of course, we should be aware that if, as in the Court of Justice of the European Union, the decision of cases is used as a source of law, as it certainly is, the case law that we make is law. So we will be making law, whether we wish to or not, by the interpretation that we give in the case. <laughs>
Um, the third principle, principle of comity with the lawmaker. That means even though we've got this power, they've got that power, we ought to have respect for their role. And, uh, and by the way, this is where I think the Eleanor Sharpston, the Advocate General, had it right. This is the ground of principle on which the Court of Justice should have gone along with the Advocate General. It showed uh, a kind of disrespect for the role of the legislature, for the, for the court to create compensation for flight delays, in my view. And if we had more time, I'd, I'd, I'd defend that provocative proposition um, somewhat further. I, I think they were not respecting the role of the legislature in a way that's only possible in, in the court of justice and, and arises, perhaps, from its genuine law-building role, its role of creating a constitution and then filling in the law. It's turned itself into a sort of deputy, not even a deputy legislature, but an, a, an overseeing legislature. Um, briefly, to, to, to just to illustrate this principle of comity, let me remind you of something that some of you will be much more familiar with than I am, which is the attitude of the German constitutional court to the work of the Court of Justice of the European Union, which, and, and it has, it, it has the authority to interpret European Union law, but what if it does so in a way that's off the rails so that it's saying that something is within the competence of European agencies when it's not. And what if it goes against the German constitution? Well, the answer in principle, you might say, is easy. Then the German constitutional court, with its commitment to the law, to lawfulness, and its obligation to give effect to the constitution of Germany, must disregard the decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union, and not just the decisions of the court, but other agencies too. And this, in my view, this passage shows that court's attitude of comity, respect for their role, which makes it very hesitant in practice um, to, to, to hold that an inter interpretation of the Court of Justice is not lawful. Um, fourth principle, you have to interpret distinguish interpretation from the application of the law, and never forget that although you have the power to interpret, and you might say the duty to interpret as well, it must not be used in a way that derogates from your responsibility to give effect to the act of legislation. And fifthly, humility, um, uh, which I would discuss at length if we had more time. And, and then there's a final one, and this raises my second question for Professor Alexi. What about equity? Is it a principle of interpretation? Here's why I mentioned Aquinas, he said, only the lawmaker can interpret. It sounds like a sort of view that the, the prince, the king, is in charge of everything and everybody just has to do whatever the king laid down. Aquinas never lost sight of the reason why it might be useful for a country to have a, an authority and it's for the common good. And some of you will know that I think it's a lovely example of what Aristotle called equity. We've got a rule, and, and take it for granted that it's a valid rule, that the gates of the city are to be closed after sunset, and our citizens fleeing from the enemy, our soldiers, are going to get slaughtered outside the gates um, unless we let them in. In that case, the gates ought to be opened. Contrary to the letter of the law, he doesn't want to admit that it's contrary to the law. Contrary to the letter of the law, in order to maintain the common wheel which the lawgiver had in view. And so my question for Alexei is, and perhaps it's a, 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 something that I should already know from reading Professor Alexei's work, where does equity fit in? Does it fit in as an unprincipled power to depart from the law that, the, a, that a court must, of course, use in a way that is principled, but for which the law itself does not provide principles. Um, I tend to think that equity can, in that sense, a power for which the law does not prescribe the principles can be a legitimate role for a court. And some people want to describe it as interpretation when they do that. And I, and I am puzzled about its relation with interpretation. So I will stop there. Um, and I don't want to say that these are the only principles of legal interpretation. Here's another one, justice, but I, won't, I don't have time for the substantive principles of interpretation. Thank you.